Hello and welcome to Showcase, coming to you from our studios in Istanbul. The notorious B.I.G. in a Kuji sweater in front of the Twin Towers. Or the black and white Tupac close-up with a white bandana on, on a Rolling Stone cover. If you remember any of these photographs, tune in for an exclusive interview with the legendary Chi Modu, the man behind some of the most iconic images in hip-hop history. But first... The environmental crisis takes center stage in Helsinki Design Week. From Africa to Brazil, we'll tell you the story of a most unusual musical instrument. From million dollar art pieces to expendable junk, damaged artworks find refuge at New York's Selvage Art Institute. Celebrating its 15th anniversary, Helsinki Design Week takes over the Finnish capital with more than 200 events taking place between September the 5th and the 25th. This year, the festival explores the intersection of design and science, showcasing designers and innovators leading the way in the development of climate-friendly solutions. Now, let's cross over to Helsinki to speak to Kari Korkman, the founder and director of Helsinki Design Week. Hi, Kari. So, uh, you are exploring the design-driven climate solutions this year. Tell us what you're doing about it and give us some examples, please. Sure, yes. Uh, greetings from, uh, from sunny Helsinki. Yes, uh, tomorrow we're going to open Helsinki Design Week and, and uh, the theme <laughs> is, uh, is learning climate, which uh, refers to the fact that... Uh, this is a learning process for all of us, and uh, and uh, we we try to maybe show path, show some new solutions uh, which combine design and science, and uh, there are material innovations, energy solutions, and uh, and circular economy, just to name few. Mm -hmm. I mean, let's speak about the the practicalities of design and climate change, for example. Your city, city of Helsinki, has the, this ambition plan of becoming carbon neutral by 2035, if that's correct. Yeah. So how do you think you can contribute to this process as Helsinki Design Week? Yeah, you're right. Uh, the city of Helsinki is very ambitious, and, and uh, but it also has, has a very detailed action plan with uh, 143 uh, actions that enable this to reach its uh, goals. And uh, Helsinki's definition of carbon uh, neutrality is to reduce uh, greenhouse uh, gas emissions generated uh, within the city borders by 80% and uh, to offset the rest. One of the, uh, the biggest challenges is, is uh, heating, as Helsinki is uh, located up in the north. We have very, uh, very cold winters, so, so heating is one of the issues which we have to focus when, uh, when aiming for, for uh, greenhouse, lowering the greenhouse emissions. And that's exactly where architecture and design has a lot to achieve. So uh, that is, you know, a, 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 an answer to your question, how, the, how is it related to, to design? So Kari, let me ask this question in a broader sense. I mean, when we think of, when some people think of design, they probably think of some beautiful objects, some fancy clothing, etc. But tell us what do you think the role of design in solving pressing global issues? That's a good question. And, and, uh, and I think what, you, what we all already notice is that, that uh, many services are replacing consumption of, of physical products. So, so designers today and in the future are more focusing on immat immaterial products, which means, of course, less waste. And, uh, but generally speaking, uh, design can be the, the glue that uh, connects uh, different parts and partners together. A new innovation cannot be successfully launched without designers. And, and I would also like to emphasize the role of, of design in communication. Uh, because uh, warming climate is an issue that has to be spread uh, widely as, as well as the use of new products and services produced for redu reducing this carbon footprint. So design has, a, has multiple roles in, in, in this mission. And now let's go back to the event, uh, Helsinki Design Week. You have several exhibitions within 
the event and the exhibitions paint a picture of what the future of design will look like. This is what you're saying, which makes me particularly curious. Can you please give us a roundup of what you're doing there? Uh, I think that's, uh, that would <laughs> take a lot of time uh, because we have 200 events around the world, around the, not around the world, around Helsinki. But uh, for us, design mm. is multidisciplinary. Uh, that means that uh, we present everything from architecture to traffic design. Uh, we also take deliberately, we take side steps uh, to the art scene and science. And uh, I think this is, this is very in the core of, of our, our idea how to present design is that the new ideas and innovations, they are always in between the disciplines. So we try to explore this gray area between the disciplines and find the new ideas that, that, uh, that come up but also getting these different uh, players together to meet up each other and, and start collaborations. That's where the, the future lies uh, in, that's how we start seeing it. Um, Kari, within Helsinki Design Week, you have, for example, Children Design Week. And you put emphasis on that and you say it's the fastest growing part of the festival. So tell us why you think children are important when it comes to design. Children they are the future decision makers. So, so we have to, of course, uh, emphasize them and, and see that they get, get the, the, the design bite, how, how, how to put it, in, in, in an early phase. But uh, children's education in Finland is ranked high and uh, globally, and, and design is more and more integrated uh, into teaching. Phenomenon-based learning, for instance, is, uh, is, is one of the, the uh, new trends uh, in, in the Finnish education and uh, we recognize phenomenon based learning by giving it a design award. Uh, that's uh, when we're talking about service design. So, so these, uh, these uh, events where we attract families with children uh, are very important for us because we grow new audience of course, but we see that as say uh, children uh, is the target group that we should, uh, not least considering the, the warming climate issue, we need to focus on, on the, the, the future and children, they are the future. Mm -hmm. All right, we'll have to leave it there, but thank you so much for joining us on Showcase today. Thank you so much. Slave trade influenced the global music scene on a vast scale. One example is capoeira, a martial art form combining self-defense, acrobatics, dance and song. It was used by Brazilian slaves to disguise the fact that they were practicing fight moves. Once outlawed, capoeira now transformed itself into a staple of Brazilian popular culture. And one thing is key to this practice. It is called berumbau, a wooden percussion instrument described as a musical bow with ancient African origins. The berimbau is made up of the calabash, the verga, stick, which is wood, wire, this is wire, of the rock or drobrau, kashija, and the baqueta, drumstick. So this is the baqueta, kashija, rock, calabash, stick, and wire. This is what I call a complete berimbau. I started to play berimbau at 16 years of age and to play with capoeira. Since my beginning of capoeira, I already wanted to play this instrument. Since I was 16 years old, 16 to 43. 
There are many years. I will play it with the rock, as it is the most common one, a flatter rock. Hold it and you can make the sound. The usual method is to play with a kind of rattle, the kashiji, which is another instrument. The birimbau is everything for capoeira. For me, it is a way to bring our energy in the capoeira circle, in the training. It helps us to interact with our students. The birimbau brings an energy, an unexplainable energy. I have played other instruments, but the energy the birimbau gives is unique. The berimbau is of African origin, and being an arch which produces sound, it relates to the first instruments. Perhaps a thousand years, some people put it to 1,500 years BC, and some people put even earlier dates. This is a type of format of instrument, the first instruments that are recognized here by archaeologists. The Berimbau is the soul of the capoeira. Without it, there isn't the capoeira because it came together with our African brothers to Brazil. Here in Brazil it was discovered, it was improved, and today it is the soul of the capoeira, and where there is capoeira, there is berimbau. There isn't capoeira without the berimbau. A capoeira sem um berimbau. Back in 2008, one of artist Jeff Koons' famed balloon animals fell and shattered into pieces. Normally, it would have gone through a restoration and reappraisal process and then been put back on the market as soon as possible. But if the damage to the work costs more to repair than its value, the insurance company declares it a total loss, then acquires the piece and sells it as salvage. And that's exactly how Kunz's famous steel dog joined a warehouse of hundreds of other damaged artworks. But thanks to New York's Salvage Art Institute, these pieces of zombie art are finding new life. Founded by Elka Krajewska, the Salvage Art Institute offers a platform for revealing, observing and encountering the condition of salvage art. It provides a medium that helps define their financial, aesthetic and social value. The Institute shows off its collections through different exhibitions, but visitors don't have to be as careful around it as they normally would be around art. Here, they are encouraged to touch the objects and rearrange the exhibition space as they please. The Institute also makes sure to remove the artist's name from the pieces and not let any object of its collection gain value. Now, to find out more about Salvage Art Institute, Let's bring Elka Krajewska in. She is the president and founder of the Institute. Hi, Elka. It's great to have you on our show. Thank you so much for coming today. So let's start from the very beginning. How was the idea born? Such a great idea, but tell us how it all started. Um, Southern Art Institute idea was born 10 years ago in a casual conversation with a PR person for an insurance company. When I found out that the artworks, when they are paid off uh, after a claim of total loss, do not simply disappear or get destroyed, but actually become uh, 
part of the uh, become ownership of insurance company and they are stored, I wanted to see and find out uh, what they are. I just tried to understand how c can one look at the something that used to be art and is no longer art. And you founded Salvage Art Institute and you, did you start buying these arts from, I mean, how did it work? No, 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 there is a, no, no, there is a, there is no transaction post uh, the transaction that has already occurred. So normally, as you know, the industry, the insurance industry, uh, when the claim is settled and the insurance company becomes the owner, the works, uh, uh, Salvat Art Institute steps in to hold them outside of the art market. So you don't, uh, they don't enter this uh, transaction world anymore. I mean, as far as I understand, this project is a critique of the art market, especially its focus on profitability. So, um, as, and also you said something in your website, which was really interesting for me. You said that they were also liberated from the obligation of perpetual valuation and exchangeability. Can you talk us through how you are positioning this project with the art, art market? Um, I don't think the art market needs my critique. Uh, I actually, I'm not, I don't have time for that. I'm more interested in making space of looking at art free of that uh, constant um, market evaluation. Um, the freedom comes from me being an artist myself and for, I, uh, basically art is my religion. It's the cl closest value that I have to, you know, my life and my interests. So I want to, the audience of Salvage Art Institute, there are young people who are really craving, they're kind of idealists, uh, they're craving the power of art to return what it's kind of, you know, we all, to, to return to the sublime, to return to the kind of space where you don't worry, uh, you don't speculate on it, you don't put it in warehouses outside of view, but you actually live with it and you appreciate its value and its power outside of just uh, its price. Um, moreover, the Salvage Art Institute is not dealing with either museum pieces or public art objects. We're focused on a very narrow uh, spectrum of works, not only that they are damaged, but most of all that they are declared of no value by the insurance world. So and Elka, I think you're wearing something damaged. special. Sorry yeah. to cut you off like that, but I think you're wearing something special there. Uh, it yes. must be a Picasso medallion, I think, right? Is it from your collection as well? Well, it's an SAI 63 which at the end of our tag will say uh, from 1973 a medallion that was made by Picasso and Hugo in 1973 in a series of 20, uh, uh, edition of 20. And um, uh, I found this uh, object actually at the bottom of a box that uh, came from uh, the insurance company donation that was marked as a group porcelain piece. So we never really opened the box before. Uh, until the show that we had in uh, Mexico, which was in Zapopan, wonderful museum uh, near Guadalajara. And I wear it sometimes for, uh, to kind of figure out what the power of this object is. But indeed, it is signed Picasso, 1973, and it has beautiful uh, handwritten description of, um, you know, um, its provenance. It sure would be really interesting, Alka Krajewska. Unfortunately, this is all the time we have for today, but... It was great having you on our show. Thank you so much. Biggie, Tupac, Snoop Dogg and Nas. Name a musician at the forefront of the hip-hop explosion of the late 80s and early 90s and you can bet that they've stood in front of Chi Modu's lens. Modu had a front row seat during what's considered the golden era of rap. His photographs still bring goosebumps to fans, more than two decades later. Showcase's Adil Halim was able to get a very rare interview with Modu, who shared his stories of hip-hop, the glitz, the glamour and the controversy. Chi, welcome to Showcase. Oh, thank you, man. Good to be here. Your photos are some of the most iconic moments, shots we have of hip-hop royalty, many of whom aren't with us anymore. I'm thinking Tupac, Biggie, Eazy e What developed this love for this art form for you? Well, you know, the love is really for photography. Like, that's what drove my passion. 
for hip hop, you know? I was a hip hop fan, of course, and I was the right age, right? Mm -hmm. But I was really a photographer first. And I saw this movement bubbling up and I knew it needed to be documented. But my real focus was making sure the person who documented it was from the community. Fortunately, many of the artists that you mentioned, like Nas, are, are still with us. LL Cool J, Mary yes, J. Yes. Blige, uh, the list goes on, Snoop. Um, when you connect with them, you know, 20 years later, you have an exhibit with Nas now. Uh, what do you guys reminisce over? What do you guys talk about? <laughs> well, when we see each other, the first thing is we kind of smile because of familiarity, yeah. right? Because we go back to when yeah. everyone was young. But I think we both look at each other with a bit of pride. You know, when I saw Snoop in September, I hadn't seen him in 24 years mm. since I did Doggy Style's premiere album, you know? And I'm proud of him, you know, because I was watching from a distance. But right away when we connect, it's like we were never apart. Because mm. that time in their career is really when they became who they are today, you know? And in fact, those pictures I took helped them become Snoop, helped them become Nas, helped them become Biggie. And so I'm very fortunate to have that position with a lot of these artists. And because of that, we're always going to be attached, no matter where their career goes. And I say to people all the time, they've done thousands of photo shoots since the ones they've done with me. But the ones they've done with me are the ones they remember. And in fact, the ones the public want. So it's kind of strange, you know, like I, I have the pictures of you, so I don't really need the modern version of you. And that's the reality of photography. Can you walk us through you know, some of those memorable shoots with you know, these iconic artists that we know, but you might know them more personally? Sure. I mean, we can start with Tupac. He's one everyone always asks me for. I'll go on the record. I don't think he's alive, <laughs> officially. You know, I think he's gone. But uh, Tupac was a pretty interesting character in that the public saw him one way, but we saw him in a different way. Hmm. We saw him as a very focused man on a mission. You know, and so when you look at the content of photographs I did of Pac, they're really pretty systematic and covered the full breadth of this human being, mm. from the laughter to the portraiture to the serious look, all those things. He orchestrated a lot of that. Like, he knew how important he was, you know? And so he's the only artist I ever sent home because of equipment malfunction. Yeah. Out of all of my <laughs> career, it's the only guy I ever sent home. And he came back the next day yeah. early like he did the first day. What about current, uh, I mean, people who are still with us, like someone like a Nas or a Snoop? Or oh, yeah, I mean, I just saw Nas in Finland for my exhibition on Categorize there about two months ago or so, mm -hmm. you know? And that was kind of wild to see Nas, you know, <laughs> like these many years later. Right. He looks the same. Yeah, he does. <laughs> he <looks laughs> hasn't aged. Hasn't aged a bit. And it's actually smoother, you know what I mean? Still a bit shy. Mm -hmm. Nas is always semi-shy, you right. know? But with a microphone, absolute control of the stage. Right. You know, and so, but it was nice to see him. And we actually got to talk about the picture in his bedroom, you know, and the Nintendo, and the Commodore 64, because his teacher told him he should learn how to code. Really? So he had a Commodore 64 computer. You know, I didn't know that. You know? Fast forward, he's done so much stuff with Silicon Valley, right? Like it's hilarious <laughs> now. But he actually said his teacher was right. He should have listened back then. He just wasn't ready, you know? Right. Hip hop is a genre that's often stereotyped uh, in a certain way. But how did you be, create the comfort with these artists um, to be able to show, like you said with Tupac, a full person, not just what we see on TV or, or on, on videos, uh, but how did you, again, create that comfort with them f for them to open up to, the, to you? Um, I, uh, I have a little trick that I do with my camera and with people. It's really my personality. Mm. That's first and foremost. And when I approach my subject, I come with open arms. You know, and you have no choice but to hug me, right? Because <laughs> right. if I come like this, you're going to tighten up. Right. So I come and you see nothing on me. Right. I'm actually coming to take you somewhere. And that really helps a lot, you know, because I lead with the warmth, you know. And when I'm warm, my camera's warm. And a warm camera, they give you a photograph that actually can live for a long time. That's the trick to it. And some people have, you know, criticized... Uh, you, some of you work for you know either glorifying violence or you know could be drug use in some of the photos, but those are conscious decisions that you made to to, to have these um, artists in that in that light. H how did you respond? How do you respond to that? Well, I'm a I'm a photojournalist, documentarian. That's real. What mm -hmm. you see there, it's not staged. Right. You know, and so those guns were actually necessary for Snoop to have. I was with him when they were pulled out at times. You know, that's really the community and the culture 
And what I say to people, no one says a war photographer is glorifying war. Right. Right? So why are you saying a photographer is shooting in the hood, which is damn near a war zone, mm. is glorifying it? No, we're, what we're doing, like the rappers, we're showing you the truth. You know, and you decide on whether you should be mad at Snoop or the society mm. that has a 19-year-old needing a gun to survive. That's the bigger question. So I turn it right back on people. The really question is to you. Why does he need a gun? You know, not to the guy that needs the gun. The question is why does he need the gun? And that's what I try to show. Thanks for joining us, Chief. Thank you for having me, brother. That's it on this episode of Showcase. Head to our YouTube channel for more from the world of culture and the arts. I'm Ilfede Kitli. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.